King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good gifts and giver of life. Come and abide in us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O good one. <clears throat> okay. I do hope that you've caught up on um, the ones that you may have missed, though these can be a little bit independent, they build. So if you go back and look at them and fill in anything you missed, you'll find continuity that is really helpful. Welcome, Allison, and welcome, Jennifer. Good to see you. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. So tonight we're going to talk about the orthodox understanding of the church. And on the title of my paper, which I didn't put in anywhere else, the church is, quote, the place of theosis, end quote. Now, through all human history, there is a driving question, which we've talked about a couple of times, but I want to bring you back to it. And that is, what is life about? Because we go about many things without thinking much about purpose, other than what is the purpose of what we're doing now, what's immediately before us. Do we have a kids to raise? Do we have a career? You know, we have things like that that we can burn through 70, 80, 90 years pretty quickly without getting back to the driving question, which is underneath it all, uh, about what is the purpose of life. And the Orthodox Church holds, the, the fathers of the church have always held that the answer to what the purpose is, is to become with God. That is the theosis, that which is the pur purpose of human life. People, no matter what, quote, religion or non-religion they are, can be confused because they think the aim of our existence is primarily to become good or to be adjusted or become moral, to be accepted in society, to have a well-adjusted society and well-balanced personalities. And that really all goes all the way back to Chinese philosophy where in Chinese philosophy, the fruition or the purpose of life is to be a well-adjusted, morally upright contributor to the society that, you're, that they were in. <clears throat> that approach to be moral and well-adjusted is called pietism. And that notion is not essentially the purpose of the ecclesia, which is the Greek word that described what was going on and what we call the church. That's how we translate it, ecclesia. You've heard of the term ecclesiastical. It's about the, bo the body, which is the gathering, which is the word we call church. Pietism is a gross misconception and is a result of Protestant Reformation and the evolution of Western Christianity so that by the time they Puritans got to the shores of America and many other groups. Pietistic control of everybody in the small communities uh, was the model of Christianity to them. Neither is the church or Christianity primarily a spiritual pursuit to give us relief from what oppresses us. It's not the purpose of the church. It's not to make us free of hang-ups or psychological baggage or to free us or to our wounds or emotional highs and lows to get us over that. That's not the primary purpose. All of those things, though, can be the byproduct of a spiritual life, but not necessarily the purpose, nor necessarily why we do it or what we should expect. What the church teaches is that is that what what the church teaches, what the ecclesia, I should say, because I want to keep bringing us back to the original meaning, teaches is the means through which a human soul may attain theosis. I'll say that again. The purpose of ecclesia is to teach the means by which a soul may attain theosis or deification or Christification, in other words, saintliness or union with God. So the ultimate goal is to become perfect in the same way as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Why are we so bold to say that? Because Christ our Lord tells us that that's what we are to do. 
You become one with God in that perfection. So I remind you again, Christ didn't come into the world to make us good or moral or to behave, but rather um, he came to give himself. He didn't come to give us a book that we could 2,000 years later read about and make of it what we will, but he became God so that we may become like God. I mean, God became man so that we could become like God. And that's really literally the motto of Eastern Orthodox mysticism. And it is the reason and the purpose of what the church gives us is the, that, that uh, path of union with God. So if we're going to become followers of Christ, we are called to embrace what he revealed. And that's what it means to be a follower to embrace what he revealed, what he did, what he taught. And that is to preserve, is preserved in the church. What he did, what he revealed, what he taught is preserved in the church. And that is the basic summary of what the creed does. The creed is the skeletal outline of what it means to be a follower of Christ, to believe what he revealed, what he did, and what he taught. So the creed, which defines what we all believe in the church, isn't formulating an idea of God. It's not philosophical. Instead, it, the creed describes the experience found in Holy Scripture. When you condense the experience of Holy Scripture down to the core fundamentals, you have the creed. So that experience of, of the, what's found in the creed, which was documented in scripture, is what we call holy tradition. And I know coming from outside of orthodoxy, tradition can be very confusing because you can have a tradition of doing a slava in the, in the Serbian church and a tradition of doing something else in a different church. And none of that matters as far as traditions with a capital T, the tradition of the church. Those are traditions of the culture that are, were created to express the church. But we're not talking about those. We're talking about the the experience of God that's revealed in the church and preserved in the church. The experience that we call holy tradition is the life of the spirit of the church. It's living, not dead, always fresh. It's not something old and, and dry. Tradition isn't something old, right? It's a living thing. St. Paul tells us, and this is in that Bible, that everybody who claims to be a Christian can read. He says, hold fast to the traditions which you have been taught. And an after word is, whether by word or our epistle. Whether by word or our epistle. We know that the New Testament itself was not completely collected and received or consolidated until way after the death of the apostles. But the church was not without understanding of the instruction and guidance, the teaching that for all time since the Old Testament has been held by the people of God and was the teaching of the apostles. The church has always preserved it. So if we're gonna hold fast to the teaching well, I mean, sorry, hold fast to the traditions that they've been taught. Think about it a minute. Paul spent, what, a couple of years in Corinth? And he wrote two letters. The modern person who is focused on sola scriptura has got two letters. The church has preserved all that he taught, not recorded. It's not on the internet, but it is the living tradition that informed, illumined, and created saints, created the 
uh, rudder uh, that, not the rudder of the book, the rudder of the ark that the church is that keeps it moving forward for all time, which the gates of hell can't prevail against because those living traditions are preserved. Christ didn't come, of course, to give us a book. He came to establish the church. That's the perspective of orthodoxy. So the church of the New Testament was founded in a Pentecost. And I love that bumper sticker or that sign that says Lutheranism, 1500, you know, goes through all the different churches. And then Orthodoxy, 33 AD, when the, when the descent of the Holy Spirit happened, because that's the continuity of the church from the beginning. Remember that that outpouring of the Spirit to God and through the apostles was a culmination of the people of God from the Old Testament looking for the Messianic age. And prior to the events that we celebrate as Pentecost, the, the apostles did as Christ commanded prior. But they waited for him to reveal himself at Pentecost. Even though they experienced everything, the crucifixion, the resurrection, it was all just, whoa, what is going on? They were afraid, they denied it, they were, they were in hiding, but they did stay faithful to what he said, wait for the comforter to come who will reveal all things to you. The, so the church begins when the Messiah comes and the Lord's day is at hand. These last days are inaugurated which, in which God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's the founding of the church at Pentecost. That was the ancient prophecy to which the Apostle Peter refers to in his first sermon to Christians on that day of Pentecost, that first Sunday of Pentecost in Acts 2. It's referencing Joel, the, the prophecy of Joel. So that day, the church found, we call the founding of our church, 3,000 people were baptized. And everyone who is baptized becomes members of his body. The church is his body, as he declared. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So God dwells in us. In reference to Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Paul spoke about it a lot. So we, by our membership in the church, have received the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the sacrament of chrismation. So that Pentecost of, that was the outpouring of the Spirit continues through their laying on of hands, through this chrismation, through the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit is given to us and this has been the way that baptisms and receiving people into the, into the church has happened from the beginning in 33 AD. So today we call this ecclesia, the church, the assembly, the gathering. So what kind of an assembly or gathering is it? It's the assembly of those who wish to be united to Christ and through him with God the Father. That is the entire point of this assembly. That's the, what it's for, is to be united with Christ. So we need to recognize that this union is the realization of the body of Christ and that this is what Holy Orthodoxy is, the Holy Orthodox Church. Now, this union with Christ that happens when we become a member of the body of Christ, this union with Christ is not external nor is it compartmentalized. This union with Christ is not specifically moral, social, philosophical, philanthropic. It's not an association, it's not a club, it's not an organization. It's not something we belong to, it's not something that we can claim it's not something we do on the side of our primary things in life. 
when I belong to a church and a country club and to a neighborhood association and a, and a, and a. No, no, it's total being. To immerse oneself in Christ is to be immersed in the church. The union with Christ is not with the divine essence of God, but rather with the deified human nature of Christ, which has its purpose in deifying man. It's, we find union in that deified nature, which is the font of grace itself. It is the expression of the divine into creation to deify creation. We experience through union with him. It's the union with God, transparent face-to-face -face in permanent conscious relationship, eternally becoming perfect, going from the first step of baptism to the next height to the next height through sufferings and struggles and unconsciousness and sinning and all the things is the human condition right up until our falling apart death and dying, but we continue to struggle to climb the heights spiritually. So we're not a follower of Christ in the way that one follows a philosopher or some great teacher. Because to believe in him is to follow him and to be a member of his body, which is the church. Christ is not gone. He's not distant. He's not out there. He is in the midst of us. The church is the gathering where two or three are gathered in my name. There am I in the midst of them. We have to know and have faith and struggle to fight against our cynical worldly consciousness and instead have faith that what he said is true, what he said is perfect, what he said is holy. And as much as we can't recognize it, as much as we might be skeptical, cling to him because the skepticism of this world and of the fallen nature of creation will tear you away from your belief and it'll make it nothing to you if you don't cling to the faith of what he taught. That's why we say it's immersion in everything he did, everything he said and taught, and everything he reveals in, in the heart of hearts as you purify yourself yearning for his presence. To believe in him, to follow him, to be a member of Christ's body, the church, is what, it, what we are after. The church is the body of Christ, the real body. Church. The gathering. The assembly. The body of Christ is essentially more real than our world, but for us, it's a mystery. And despite our unworthiness or sinfulness, Christ takes us in and incorporates us into his body. We actually become transformed. You, me, everyone. We go from height to height in our faith. If we will cling to our faith, pray God, to strengthen our understanding and our experience of the church internally. So he makes him us members of himself. And again, we become real members of Christ because of that, not just followers of a code of morality. We don't just follow rules. Rules and conduct keep us in the playground, uh, the, in the arena of spiritual transformation. It's not that they're worthless, but that isn't all it is. We have to find the inner reborn, remade, becoming a new person, changed. And we sometimes are changed in the twinkling of an eye in the littlest ways, subject to becoming gods and rejecting the fall. 
entering into eternal life. As the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians, we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. It's amazing how this kind of perspective is supported over and over and over in everything Christ said and did and revealed and revealed through his apostles in the letters of Paul and Peter and John. So to be a member of the church is to be members of the body of Christ. In order to become a member of his body, in order to be incorporated into Christ, one needs to be baptized. Someone who has never been baptized is not a member of Christ's body. Even if he lives a moral life according to human standards or supposed Christian principles. We're all members of the church. We're all members of Christ. I follow Christ in my way. You follow in your way. Nothing could be farther from the truth. You're not members of his body unless you're baptized. Only say that because it's what Christ said. So the purpose of the church is the same purpose of creation and the first form humans, which is the purpose of creation the purpose of first form humans? It's the glorification and sanctification of man to be fully in divinity with God, irradiated with the energies of God and refined by the holy fire into perfection like gold in a furnace. Now, since we are members of Christ's body, Christ's life is offered to us and becomes our life. So we are enlivened and saved and deified. We could not be deified if Christ did not make us members of his body. We can't do it. He does it. We could not be saved if the holy mysteries of the church did not exist because these mysteries make us one, one body with Christ. And as according to the Holy Fathers, we share the same body and the same blood as Christ, all of us who are members of the body. We are, in fact, one body and one blood with Christ. These mysteries begin for us at baptism, where we, as he said, go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's how you join the body of Christ. Through the mystery of baptism, through the grace that comes through baptism. Now, theosis in the church after baptism is always about becoming. We're becoming Christians always. We're becoming members of his body. Becoming, becoming, becoming. It never stops becoming. We don't get our ID card and say, I'm, all, I'm there, I've, I've achieved it. It's always becoming, always stepping up into it. Always believing, but not believing, but be believing. Always being believing. And to do that, is, that's found in communion. St. John Chrysostom says, God has nothing more to give man than what he gives him at Holy Communion. Man cannot ask anything more of God than what he receives from Christ in Holy Communion. So being baptized, chrismated, confessing, we commune through the body and blood of the Lord and we too become gods by grace. We unite with God. We are no longer strangers for we have become familiar with God. So inside the church, in which we unite with God, we live this new reality in Christ. This is the life of the church of Christ who becomes our gift. It becomes a gift to us 
given from the Holy Spirit. So everything about the church, in the church, and what we do in the church is intended to lead us to theosis. The liturgy that we come to, where we stand together alone with God, when we step into liturgy, it's so important not to come to liturgy like you might go to a meeting or go to a concert. The choir is not performing. The choir is singing and chanting the prayers that we all pray in our hearts. It is ours to take in the divinely inspired words of liturgy and to own them as we pray them, as we offer them to God together. The work of the people and for the people is what liturgy means, liturgy. Sometimes people focus on it as the work of the people, but that's actually not the, the, as precise a meaning as the work of the people. Not that you're doing the work, but the work of prayer on you, for you, through you. It's the work. It's a simple analogy. This is where the dough of your being is needed so that it can rise. So it's the liturgy that is, is there and the mysteries of, of mysteries meaning, the word mysteries, because maybe I haven't, that's probably not in the, in the definitions or glossary I made. Mysteries are what we call the, the, the Western word is sacrament, so we use it a lot because it's common understanding. Sacramental grace is a mystery. We refer to them as the mysteries because the most important part of what's happening in sacraments is not the rite that we go through for sacraments, the sacramental rite, which is the things we do to exercise the God-given uh, grace that that comes through the things we do, the elements and, and what the priest's prayers are, etc. It's the mystery of what's taking place that is what's important. So thus we've referred to them as the mysteries. So the church leads us to theosis through the liturgy that work on the people, through the mysteries that we partake of, through the worship we offer, through the sermons that you hear, if, if the priest can articulate a few good points, uh, on what the scripture means and what's going on in the, in the life of the church. Through fasting, which is abstinence, of turning from this world and not being so satiated with this world that we don't have a hunger for the spirit. All these things lead to one thing. And that is that the church is the place of theosis. The church is not social or cultural or historical organization. And it's in purposely not intended to resemble other organizations in the world. It's not like one of the other corporate, you know, we have to be incorporated in this country. Not all countries require that. It's not natural to the church. It's a functional thing we have to do to exist in our society. Like the world has lots of good institutions. It has hospitals and establishments that do all kinds of things that are beneficial to society. But the church is the sole place for the communion of God with man. Theosis of man. Those, that doesn't happen in other types of organizations. So only within the church can man become God and nowhere else. You don't become God by going to a university. That's a bold statement, man becomes God. Adopted, like Christ, totally undeserving, not even imagining that we have any capability of being anything like God, but he, we are created in his image. And it's the restoration of his likeness that all of eternity is intended for. We get a kickstart here in this world. We know we're going that direction in this world, or we're not. 
We don't become God in doing social service or good works or helping people. You don't become God through that. That is the outpouring of our union with Christ. So no matter how much worldly institutions and systems progress and how much better and more refined civilization is and how much science achieves, and yes, I know the billionaires think we're going to the stars and that we're going to solve the problem of dying. Man, when you look at how people progress, the last thing in the world we need is humans living forever. What a disaster that would be. It'd be a disaster just to extend their life to 200 years in most cases. What if we could do that? Oh, how horrible would that be? I used to joke that, why do we need to be saved? I said, could you imagine God turning you loose on creation for all eternity the way you are? You went from this beautiful, pure little child to delighting in the beauty of things around you, learning and creating and being all inspired. And then you started thinking about you. And everything revolves around you. And oh yeah, you do a little bit of social work and you do a little bit of volunteer work at certain times of the year to appease your conscience because you know you need to do good things. But basically our lives are all self-centered. Can you imagine knowing that no matter what, you live eternally and you get to do whatever you feel like as long as you survive? What a horrible idea. Only within the church can we become God. Now, what does that mean for our daily living? Well, weak and sinful men go through crisis and difficulties within the church. So the church is full of scandal. Lots of stupid things have happened. A lot of mean-spirited things have happened because fallen human beings take advantage of things even inside the church. So yes, it's possible for scandals to happen within the church. And we can see it all around us, especially because we have the internet. So now we don't just know with how we are, you know, Bill's a little like that and Brandon's a little like that, but we love them all. And, Poor Ryan, he has to put up with us. And, you know, we go through all of this. But we can manage that because we have a relationship. But, man, you look across the Internet at the whole breadth of society and you can find all kinds of little rotten things to be upset about or cause us to get distracted by. It just happens. That's the way it is. And these things happen because the human beings within the church are on their way to theosis. They have not achieved anything close to it. And it's very natural that human weaknesses exist. We're becoming gods, but we sure ain't close. It's almost silly to think that we're on the way, but God promises we, us we are. Christ promises it. <clears throat> and you're gonna meet people in the church who are spiritually dead. but not forever. There's all stages from sinner to saints. So by all means, do not judge. Don't judge those around us. The saint you do see started out maybe as bad as the worst person you can think of. Don't judge, it's all God's. My own experience with my brother, unbelievable the transformation that happened in him. I've been faithfully plodding along in the church for a long time, and he was not even close. Rejected it. But amazing transformation happened when he converted, and he zoomed right past me to heaven, and I'm still just plodding along. You can't judge people. All you can do is stand in awe of the work of God happening in people's lives. That's what we're supposed to do. One of the most common things that many people who don't understand what the church is, one of the most common things that people say is they point out 
oh, but they're hypocrites. Oh, I don't like to go to church. They're a bunch of hypocrites. But resist the temptation to feel that. Never leave the church. Don't say I'm not going because they're a bunch of hypocrites because it's only within the church that we have the possibility to unite with God. It isn't, you're not dependent on the people around you. I mean, you're not dependent on the way they behave. You're dependent on the people around you for the way you behave, for what you experience and how much the love of God moves through you. That's why we never can deal with what it takes to shed sin and become Christ-like when we're by ourselves. It's not possible to do it by yourself. The church is the earthly dwelling place of God and mankind, says Revelation 21, 3. I'll say it again. The church is the earthly dwelling place of God with mankind, according to Revelation 21, 3. So if we want to know God, we come to meet him in the church or via the church or through scriptures and prayers and the things the church has preserved. That's how we come to know God. So the creed immediately continues after it deals with the Trinity uh, about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and the work of Christ as God incarnate, Jesus as the Word incarnate. And it continues with these words. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Notice the exact language of the creed. It reads, I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Now, a lot of people, I think, probably confess the creed, and they think what they're saying is that they believe that the church exists. They just sort of say, I believe in God, and the church is here. But that's not what it says. Our statement of belief in the church is not an affirmation of the existence of the church. In the creed, we presuppose the church's existence. It's the church that gives us the creed. We're now declaring that we believe her. St. Paul says, in case I am delayed, I write so that you may know now one ought to conduct himself in the household of, uh, how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. He's saying that the church as the pillar and support of truth, the household of God, this means she is our authority. It means she is not a man-made organization. It means that our sinfulness doesn't taint the church. The church has called us out of darkness. We're born anew in her and the water of baptism by the power of the Holy Spirit. So yes, we have provided the faith and we are, allow ourselves to integrate into Christ. And we are the ones who put him on, but our sinfulness doesn't taint that. It's the same with the priest. It's the same with all the offices and functions in the church. It's not, the, it's not dependent on my personal holiness. It's not. Everything that happens, the prayers, the mystery of the, of the grace of God is in spite of me. It's simply my faithfulness to perform the right to follow the teachings of the church and for the people to yearn for the grace of God to come and be in us and with us all and to heal us all. In another place, Christ says he will establish his church and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. So you see, there is much more than its existence. How am I doing for time? Still good. So let's take what we say in the creed, because the creed is our statement of belief. As I've said before, when you accept the creed as your statement of belief, you're able to be an Orthodox Christian because your beliefs are hanging on the fullness of what the Christian faith with Holy Orthodoxy proclaims. You don't need to know a whole bunch of stuff you just need to affirm your belief in the things that define our faith. So the church is one. 
Okay, that means there's not many. It's not a whole bunch of little disassociated groups. It's one. The church as a body is one. A function of it being the body of the divine human Christ. He doesn't have many bodies. He has one body. So the church is one. So up until the schism with the Roman Catholics over the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, and it took that long for the schism to really take uh, effect, because even though we say 1054, that was just one act by a couple of knuckleheads who created a, an official declaration. Up until that time, there was a consensus, West and East, about what it means to be a church and in unity of belief and practice and worship as the traditions of the apostles were passed down. Unity for 10, 11, 12, 13 centuries of one consistent belief by all. The fragmentation of belief systems in the West, at Western, and in the way the West has adopted Eastern junk and paganism and all kinds of whatever we want to make our truth, even down to the point that we say, speak your truth and I'll speak my truth. It's just totally disconnected from reality, frankly. The way that's happened is a really late development. Up until that time, there was a consensus. Unfortunately, the consensus went away when the schism occurred and then further when the Reformation happened and further disintegrated into what we have today. But the consensus was there was one. Jesus didn't say, I will build many churches. He said, I will build my church, singular. And when we infirm and confess our belief in the one holy church, we are saying that we believe in one church. It's simply pretty, pretty much ignored outside of orthodoxy, that concept. Now, between Jesus and his body, the church, there's no separation. Christ is not a decapitated head that people can just find. You don't just on your own say, I'm going to be connected to the, my, the head. My head is Christ. So to touch the church is to touch Christ. And to find the true church is to find Christ. St. Paul met the living Christ who said to him, remember Christ already ascended? Christ said, why are you persecuting me? The Lord was ascended. And St. Paul was persecuting the church. If you don't know it, St. Paul is said to be, to have stoned people, including the first martyr, Stephen, that the head of that rabble who were stoning the people who were blaspheming was Paul. He was a rabid defender of God's people. So now he's saying, Christ is saying, why are you persecuting me? Because he was persecuting Christ, the church. He was persecuting the church, and Jesus referred to it as me. Why are you persecuting me? And also to really stress the point of oneness, Jesus is called the head of the church in Ephesians 5. Now, the head has what? One body, right? That's the way kind of things work in creation. And the church is his body. In Ephesians and elsewhere, we're told that those who are in Christ via baptism are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Those who are baptized are members of his body. This oneness is guaranteed by Christ in John 17, 21. I ask that they may be one even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us. So the unity of the church is guaranteed by its nature as the body of Christ with him as the head. So that's about the phrase one church. It goes on, one holy. Holy is that it's sanctified and purified. 
by Christ, who assumed it and made it his body. He makes us his body. We are sanctified by it. The church has the qualities of Christ. It is a place of the dwelling for the Holy Spirit, and therefore the church is holy itself. It doesn't mean that every person is perfect, just like we talked about. There are all of us sinners in it. It does mean that she is washed clean of her sins by the Holy Spirit, and her members are in the process of transformation into perfection. The church is the guardian and the propagator of true godly virtues, which impart to us uncreated grace from Jesus the head. In that our souls are healed and saved from the state of sickness, the church makes people holy. It makes, and is in the process of making us saints. I got a good chuckle one day when I went down to the university in Arizona and I pulled into the parking lot and you know those little bumper things that they stop your car the curb stops in a parking lot you know your wheels go up against those concrete things that are sitting there and everyone was painted saints 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 that meant church parking I thought that was well okay so they, but they just assume that if you're at the church you're one of the saints well uh we would say the church is making us saints. So the next thing is Catholic. Now, most of the time in today's world, Catholic means Roman Catholic or Latin or Frankish, depending on which scholar is talking to you, because the Byzantine church was the Roman church, which is, it was all one. Catholic, though, it refers to and we use the term Catholic Church because it means the whole or the entire. It exists in the whole world. It contains the whole truth. And the life of the church is commonly shared and given to all men. It's for everyone, everywhere, at all times. That's Catholic. Universal. Yeah. Catholic means primarily that the church is whole and full and lacks nothing, perfection. There's nothing that isn't in it if you're in God, in it if you're pursuing God. So where two or three are gathered, this small band of apostles, the little church, our little mission, we're all the Catholic church, as is every right-believing, teaching, worshiping, and living Orthodox parish. We're all united to our bishops, and we're all united to the tradition and the teachings. All things that uh, he has taught us are held by the church. And the last word, apostolic, has its beginning in Christ. Because Christ was sent by the Father to make his body, to remain united with us it's, and him, his body, forever. So it's not something that just anyone does. It has connection to the apostles and the teaching of the apostles. The church is a direct descendant of the apostles and is building upon the foundation they laid. For the apostles are the foundation of the church, says Paul. It's a direct connection. It's the continuity of teaching. It's not just the laying on of hands. If someone has an apostolic claim all the way back, like my person who ordained me, who would ordain me, or me, goes all the way back, which Lutherans try to claim, it doesn't matter if you're teaching a divergent reality. You're no longer apostolic. It doesn't matter how you got uh, chrismated and ordained. You have to have all of it. You have to have both. Apostolic is an unbroken line of ministerial consecration, yes. It's the grace of the Holy Spirit conveyed through the laying on of hands in holy orders that's been passed on for 2,000 years, yes. And it enables our clergy to protect and preach the true faith which has been once and for all delivered 
to the saints, in, as it says in Jude 3. Truth has been once and for all delivered. Now it's for up to us to carry on the con continuity. So I describe my role as being ordained by a bishop. I'm just his branch or his hands because bishops consecrate bishops consecrate bishops who consecrate priests and deacons to assist them in the ministry of the church. My job is to preserve and convey what I've been given. My job is to plagiarize to the best of my ability everything. I heard about a pastor here got run out of his church for plagiarizing. I said, well, that's too bad because my only job is to plagiarize. If I can't plagiarize, I've got, I, there's nothing, I'm useless. You shouldn't listen to me. I plagiarize the, the best of my ability what the saints, the apostles, those who have achieved theosis, those who have experienced God and been revealed in God, what they give us. So our job is to enable the continuity of being the church's continuity of being, even though that cells come in, it's like your body. You change over cells every seven years or whatever it is, right? Well, the body, the church has spinning off. Um, we come and we die every 70 years. There's another and another and another, but the body continues. That same vision is there. Like the apostles, To be apostolic is to receive a commission. The church has received a commission, is sent out. For that is what the apostle means, one who is sent. That's what the word means, one who is sent. The church knows herself to be the very hands and feet of the risen Christ today in the world. And it's sent forth to bring forth the good news. That's the church's purpose, to convey that good news of forgiveness, salvation, and healing of the world, which is currently under the power of the evil one. So the church was commissioned to baptize all people, as he says at the end of Matthew. So a missionary aspect is essential to her nature and work. And so much of what we read in saints is either spending their life in pursuit of theosis and people coming to them and them conveying the truth that they've received or in going out as apostles and spreading the good news to those who have no hope. And I think the last thing I'll say before I run totally out of time, we got a couple minutes, is that the church is therapeutic. It's one holy Catholic and apostolic. That's what we say in the creed. But the nature of what we experience is intended to be therapeutic. But just like any therapy, we have to submit ourselves, not to rules and a moralistic structure primarily, though there's going to be discipline and decorum and protocol, but those aren't essential. Those are the outgrowth. Rather, we got to understand that submission of our, who we are to something that's meant to repress our sinful nature out of fear of punishment or for desire of a reward is pretty limited. I'll say it again because most Christian adherence is a combination of the two. If it hasn't degenerated into feeling better about yourself and finding a peaceful place to exist in God's abundance, it's repressing sinful nature out of fear of being punished or out of hope of reward. Usually you got a choice and you're trying to choose the better of the two. Hmm. Eternal punishment, eternal bliss. I, I think I'll go for the bliss. So I'm going to repress my sinful nature 
and follow the rules, follow the moral code, so that I can withstand judgment. <clears throat> but the church, which is the bride of Christ, which is his body, nourished by the Holy Spirit in the sacraments and keeping divine vigil, is what we're supposed to submit ourselves to, to become brides of Christ in a certain way. Now, all this is done within the context of the family of God, led by a pastor understanding that the church is ther therapeutic. It's a hospital. It's not a courtroom. You might have seen a meme that says that. The church is therapeutic. It's meant to save us in a storm-tossed world that we're in. It's the repository of the teachings of Christ as given to the apostles and been guided ever since. Now, when the church fathers such as Cyprian of Carthage, the early fathers, made bold statements as this, he said, he cannot have God as his father who has not the church as his mother. You'll hear the church referred to as she, the church, she. That, does that mean, this is the question, that all non-Orthodox people are going to hell? What is the Orthodox perspective on the condition of Christians and non-Christians outside of the Orthodox church? People who are trying, looking at, trying, making an attempt to follow Christ, but they're not in the Orthodox Church. Well, the Orthodox theologian George Florevsky was even bolder than Cyprian of Carthage. He wrote, outside the church there is no salvation because salvation is the church. How does that work materially in time and space? I don't know, but it's something to contemplate. There is no salvation outside the church because salvation is the church. The life, experience, the teaching, everything that is salvation is the church. We don't know how people who had deep inner insights might view that. So let's define salvation one more time in relation to the church. Salvation, which is soteria in Greek, means spiritual wholeness, health. Salvation is not an instant experience, nor is it the reward of getting a passing grade in holiness, nor is it the result of God's arbitrarily waiving heaven's entrance requirements. That isn't salvation. Salvation is the successful completion of a long process of spiritual growth until we finally become, quote, perfect, even as our Father in heaven is perfect. And whatever we lacked here is made up by, through grace, just as coming into perfection is by God's grace. It is where our hearts and minds are. So thus you have the thief on the cross who had in every single way broken all the commandments of what the people of God might have wanted, who had no understanding of any of it, but what he saw as he hung there in awe next to Christ made him say, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. I can barely say those words because in the end, that's all of us. That's all of us in the end. And he had done nothing but utter that plea. And Christ promised him he would be in his kingdom. The question is, when you're taken from this world, will you be in that space where you're focused on the only thing important? And that is your hope in the salvation that Christ bestows. The church is where that salvation is found. Else, people just kind of come and go and come and go and they have moments where they were inspired and they remember once when they sang in the choir and they remember once when there was a great lead 
singer and worship band that was just awesome and they got all high about that and they're just in a tumult of experience that is not salvation. Will God save them? That's his duty. Our duty is when, in, when faced with the full teaching of the church, the tra it's the tradition, as Paul talked about, the fullness of what Christ gave us. Are we yearning to live salvifically? And salvation is the church. Salvation consists of becoming holy in order to be saved we must cooperate with God's saving process. This requires correct understanding of God, a right relationship with God, true doctrine, and true worship. That's what the meaning of orthodoxy is. True doctrine, true worship. Thus, salvation in true worship and true doctrine is lived in and is the church. 